guys, we had a sick kayak fishing obsessed live show last night where we had two brothers fishing on, JT and Jeremy Hickman, where we talked about how to dominate August kayak bass fishing. So I edited down the live show for you and here's the juice. Let's go. August bass fishing is interesting. It's a transitional month. The bass are, you know, beginning of August, they're doing something. It could be much different than the end of August, especially when you get some of those cold nights. I feel like I'm already starting to get some cold nights. To be it's, honest with you. This year is it's so weird. weird. I had a jacket on this morning, the entire morning. Because... We've never had this many tornado watches and warnings in cool summer. It's like, what is going on? It's, it is. It's crazy. I had a full day in the rain yesterday. The rain, the, the temperature of the lake I fish a lot dropped five degrees. Yeah. And wow. like, what, it is the bass were not. There, I was not on them this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Hit me. What are, what are the bass doing this time of year from the beginning of August to the end of August? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm finding all my fish deep. And when I say deep, it's relative to the body of water you're fishing on. Mm. One of them that I'm currently fishing is the, the deepest is 15 feet. The average is like six foot. So you find those holes where it's 10, 12, 14 feet. Add a little brush to them. That's home. There you go. So is that is that for the entire month for you? That or it you is start doing me, something a little it, different. Well, the the fish are doing what they're doing. There's always going to be shallow fish. The majority of the bigger fish I'm finding are a little bit deeper. But this is also where I do a massive bait switch. I I completely change the baits I've been throwing in the early part of summer, and I have a whole method of. Well, like my frog, I go from a full-size frog down to a small frog. I'll go from a 10-inch worm to a fatter 8-inch, like Ocho, on a uh, Magnum shaky head. And then no rattles in any of the baits that I'm throwing. I eliminate so sound. My crankbaits have no rattles. My walking baits have no rattles. I only throw baits without rattles this time of year. Okay, so walk me through the, the you shared what you did. Sure, why you did it. Well, I find this time of year, the frogs, if you look around on a rainy evening... There's going to be these little frogs, mm. and I think it's just the the bass know when the, the frogs are, you know, smaller, easier to eat. Um, so I have a lot more success on not just catch or getting blow-ups, but landing the fish on the small mini frogs. Okay. Rattles uh, in crankbaits or topwater, everybody all year long has been throwing something that has rattle and making lots of sound. <laughs> right. If you take away the sound but give them the, the presentation for example my my top water baits have all been like sexy shad and and you know bait fish looking this time of year it's all black i don't know why but black works in, at noon in the middle of the day and it works great right before before the sun goes down um in, in terms of i fish a 10 inch berkeley power worm 90 percent of the time all the way from <laughs> from uh, winter to now and now you tell Grammy bring five rods he only needs one <laughs> yeah, yeah i bring one well, <laughs> well two, was... i'll have a seven inch and then a 10 inch of the same thing and they'll eat one or the other but the reason i change with my worms and go over to a shaky head it's a, a more subtle uh presentation you look at a 10 inch worm with a ribbon tail in this hot water it goes zooming down past them and they're like no that ain't natural hmm. a slower more subdued fits in this time when the water is so hot um and there again you can catch fish on a shaky head from winter all the way around through the next winter yeah so for those who don't fish a shaky head it's not one of those like mainstream i mean people fish it don't get me wrong um but explain what a shaky head is and Actually, more importantly I've, how do you I've work got the one i have tied on right now and it'll for, surprise you all right let's see it for those on the podcast he left his chair <laughs> And he's grabbing things. <laughs> oh, he's back. Here we go. So JT's going to know exactly why, but he is the reason why I have this tied on for the next tournament I'm fishing. It's one of the big Magnum uh, from Do It Molds mm. with a big Ocho on there. And that chartreuse, I think it's the, the dumbest rig ever. That's what it should be called. But it flat out <laughs> catches fish and it catches big fish. And I haven't even told JT that I'm fishing that because I was too embarrassed because I was laughing at him when he showed me. Okay. I was like, dude, you ain't going to catch nothing. And he goes on and catches a 20 inch fish on it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, uh, so for those listening in, what Jeremy yeah. was showing was the Do It Mold Magnum Ned 
finesse. Uh, it's a magnum net, is what it is. That and weight then, was what? Like it looked like it's, half it's half pretty it, good it, size. It's, 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 it's about almost a like dragging a wobblehead. Yeah, because when you think about the size of the ochos, you know, being a, a bigger soft plastic than your average, and then that head, mm. that's at least a half ounce. Wow. And what I like throwing that is the Z Man. Uh, they, it's literally a Magnum TRD. Oh, I it's, have one of those. It's, it's 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 monstrous. But you know, we discovered this last year when I was playing with that with that head when they first came out with it, dragging it through deep humps and brush piles. And on a lake where you know we catch maybe an average of fifteen inch fish, it's not known for big fish. I walk out of there with two seventeen inch fish, base almost on back to back casts, mm. and it's like. Okay, we've got something. We got something going on here. It's just, it's just something that's a little bit different, but uh, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I got to take one second to shout out a friend, Skid Pig, from down in Australia. If you guys want to see some cool videos from a dude in Australia ripping it up offshore in his boat, go check out Skid Pig's channel. <laughs> He's a long time. We've been following each other for a few years now, nice. and he puts out some quality, entertaining fishing content from down below i gotta <laughs> what's up brother <laughs> i love it skid pig i love it all right so jt so when you're talking about shaky head well share kind of how you fish it when you say slow i mean walk us through like like we're new someone's tying this on for the first time how are you locating these these brush piles what are you using where are you look for where, where are you look for uh, for them at electronics you're using to get them and then take me through all the way to the hook set well, so Jeremy and I have been learning side scan down imaging for the last, you know, a little more than a year now. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, we were very simple Garmin Striker 4, water temp and depth. Um, but what, Scott, what side scan and down imaging allows you to do is kind of patrol your, your lake or pond wherever you're at looking for brush piles off in a, you know, 60, 70 foot range. And then when you kind of notice something, because it'll look pretty obvious. It'll look like limbs or things laying down. If you, it's funny because you know, speaking back to side imaging, my first ever reel on Instagram to hit over a million views, which shocked me. Today I noticed that it was a video I put up last week showing a boat ramp that I was going over, showing the boat ramp, and then showing the boat ramp on on underwater. Yeah, and it's the same kind of thing. So finding those kind of detail things with side scan. And then rolling over it with a down imaging just to look down and see where it's at. And Jeremy still does something that's pretty old school that a lot of people may not think about is back in our boater days, we would carry marker buoys so that when mm -hmm. we would see something, we would go over it, drop it in the water, and then you go back and you cast to it. And then as you're starting to drag the bait back through the brush pile, you're like, oh, okay, there it is. My marker buoy might be off by like two feet, but you know, in relation to where you feel the brush pile, to where that marker buoy is to start making those repeated casts. And it was so funny. I was telling Jeremy and Matt the other day when I was out fishing, I found this brush pile and I drag a shaky head through it. They weren't huge. I mean, I was catching dinks, but it's like every other cast I was pulling up a fish. Okay. Let me try a Texas rig. Oh, caught a fish. Oh, let me try a free rig. Oh, caught a fish. If, if I'd have stayed there, I probably could have thrown a Ned rig and pulled one out of that brush pile. Mm. But you know, a shaky head is very much like an old school jig worm without the skirt. Um, and you're just, it's just a stand up. And I like using floating, uh, Elastec, you know, Z-Man products to, mm -hmm. uh, to keep that tail up in the air, but X zone and others make good stand up baits to kind of do that. But you're literally just casting past it and dragging it over either the rocks or a, um, or a brush pile. And, you know, you feel them thump your spinning rod pretty, you know, pretty good. And we got turned on to this because we never really focused on it that much until we ran into um, Old Town Pro Staffer Casey Reed, mm. who is one of the top dogs, you know, in kayak bass fishing uh, at Kentucky Lake. And we just happened to be fishing the area he was in. And we got to talking to him quite a bit. And, you know, him and another guy, Alex Miller, they were just running around from spot to spot. A couple of casts, drag it over the brush pile. If they got bit, they got bit and moved on to the next. Oh, wow. But Jeremy and I said, OK, you know what? This is a technique we don't really focus on that much so we had casey come on a live stream a few months later and he walked us everything about you know shaky heads including the company that makes his mm -hmm. and like the whole technique with it too but it's a very simple very easy way great for you know even bank anglers because if you're using like a tungsten shaky head you can literally drag it through the bottom and you know kind of feel you know everything it's it's 
it's literally like it's it's I won't say it's like a Carolina rig, but you really feel the rocks. You can feel the the, the changes in the surface if you're hitting you know rocks or wood or whatever. But it's a very cool finesse technique. But it's actually pretty awesome once you get used to it. And it's something that we've been working on, you know, adding to our arsenal. Because like you always say in your shows, practice things that you're not good at, you know, yeah. your non-confidence. And for us, that has been one of them, but we're actually getting better at it too. So it's not one of those things you have to have forward facing. You can literally do it, you know, with, with a little bit lesser technology and, you know, a Helix 5 with side imaging, you know, at three or 400 bucks will put you in that same you know, ability that some unit, you know, that's 12 or 1500 bucks would do as well. Yeah. So I, I, I ran the Garmin Strecker 4 for a long time. Recently just upgraded. Uh, I had a video, it, you know, you saw that at the, um, the install video for my Garmin Equimap UHG 92 SV. Yep. And when I started running that on a lake that I fish often, I'm like, holy crap. Mm -hmm. I had no clue that that giant tree was right here. I rolled over it a hundred times yeah mm -hmm. always cast to the bank never cast <laughs> to the right and they're they're i know they're sitting in there right and then you run past i never knew that was underwater i never knew this or this is what this looked like and it is it definitely increases your game it's a learning curve right you're yeah. looking at things you're like what in the world what's that shadow is that a fish what is this but it is pretty incredible and so what you're saying is that without side scan it's going to be fairly difficult to find these brush piles to to fish a, sh a shaky head yes now what you thought yeah i mean you could get lucky and go now that being said you can if you if you're fishing a bigger lake where the state say plants you know we call them hoosier cubes which is a square made of pallets or christmas tree brush piles things like that so if you can like study a map and say okay i go from the boat ramp over to this point and come off and then i start dragging around until i find them. a lot of people will throw carolina rigs doing stuff like that. And, and some people will naturally find piles, trees, stumps, you know, things like that as well. Um, and then sometimes you just run over them with your striker four and you see little humps on the bottom. Right. That could be a log. You don't know which way it's laying or a cutoff stump or a rock, but you start casting. And then when you start feeling things, then you start, okay, I'm sitting here. There's that tree off of this point. <laughs> you kind of start marking it in your mind where it is. But again, you go old school and get like a buoy marker. Okay, I found something here. I'm going to drop this, and then I'm going to keep casting around that area. And eventually, as you bump off of cover, you're pretty in a pretty good spot and a good chance of finding a bass. Yeah, I made homemade DIY buoy markers, and I kept I keep, people keep clowning me on them. Like, oh, I just use waypoints. I just waypoints. Like, it doesn't work for. I mean, I get it. Use waypoints to get to yep. the spot. When you're in a kayak and it's windy, and you roll by something, you know it's 20 feet off to your right. And by the time you turn around, you could be fishing 15 feet off that spot and not even know it. So oh, most definitely throw those bad boys. They're really easy to make. They're kind of expensive to buy. You'd be surprised. I mean, not expensive. Yeah. We're like 15, 20 bucks for you know a two pack. But for a pool noodle, a nail, a string, and a weight, you are you're good. You're good to go. Hundred <laughs> percent. So shaky head. You now you're you're doing you're dragging it like a, a Texas rig. However, I remember watching a Fluke Master video when I first heard about the shaky head. What's the what the crap is a shaky head? And he just basically dances the line to get that action at the end. But he's like dancing it in place. We're talking about something a little bit different here. You're dragging it over brush piles. Yeah. Have you ever tried doing the, uh, you know, basically just getting the action through dancing the line in one place? Has that been successful for any of you? I've seen where some people hold the rod and hit the back of their wrist. Yeah. And just let that action shake the worm. because And you can do that kind of with a drop shot as well, just to impart a little action, keeping it in place, but also, you know, giving it that action too. Sometimes they want movement. Sometimes they just want the natural flowing in the water. Uh, you just got, you know how it is. You got to give the fish what they want. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Caro, she says, almost have hubby convinced to give me some sort of garment or something. Absolutely. It'll, it'll change the game. It really was. It's one of those, especially I went from nothing to a Garmin Striker 4. And if you're out there running no electronics and you like that, then then go for it. But if you're looking to up your game for that for two hundred fifty dollars, by the time you power that and buy it and you buy the battery and the connections yeah. and you know, the kayak attachment, um, you'll be surprised what it does for your fishing game. It, Just, yeah, it makes all the difference in the world. And Caro, tell hubby, I said it's okay. You can get a Garmin, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. You got permission from Jeremy. So let's go ahead. Just don't even tell me. I can't. He said it's okay. Yeah. What's the budget? You going to give her a budget too? Oh, no. No, he knows. He'll take care of her. 
<laughs> I love it. You guys ever heard this? Backwards 13 says, is it true you can put a toothpick in the end of a worm to make it float and kind of stand up? That is an old school trick. Oh, gee. I mean, that is, that is, that is back there back when Jeremy first started using glass rattles in the 90s. Wow. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I kind of told the fib when I say no rattles, that's in like moving baits. Because if you're not fishing a rattle in your soft plastics every time, you're mm. missing fish. Yeah. Mm. So the Z Man just came out with that rattlesnake thing. We can shove rattles into their baits. You've seen that one? That came out of iCast recently. There's there's always some tool to sell for somebody when, when you can just push it in. Push well, it the Z-Mans are tough to put, push crap into. But to be fair, yeah, they the Z-Man products, it's, you probably need a tool to do that. Because <laughs> yeah. it's like a it's like a, a hole punch, all syringe, all in one, too. Yeah. But that's the last tech for you. It's like a surg surgical needle. And I agree. I have some of those TRD, the big ones, too perfect if you want that thing to stand up so yeah. look look at those bad boys up all right let's head over to the next question gramps what do you got what's your top oh man i'm gonna give you top five what's top five that you have set up right now like you're going out fishing tomorrow what is on your rods and does that stay all of august or do you change it up like um sometime in the middle of august uh realistically you got to play the conditions when they change because like we said this year it's it's been it's been different i mean it's i can't normally normally in in the heat of summer you're going to have fish that go deep and stay deep until the thermocline pushes them up because they like being in deeper water you have fish that want to go skinny and stay in skinny water and they'll be the ones up under your pads your frog fish and you know i'm sure i shocked everyone last weekend when i posted a picture of a frog fish um <laughs> You know, I, I and I, I didn't I didn't even have my frog rod with me. I literally tied that because somebody else pointed out, you caught a frog fish on floor carbon. OK, they were smacking. They were smacking, you know, uh, bait fish in the wheat in the in the top of the mat. And I'm just like, I got to tie a frog on. I mean, I took my jig rod and tied a frog rod. I didn't have my frog rod that is normally my punching rig with braid. Right. But I just tied the frog that I happened to bring with me. And I was just dragging it over the mats. And I had. I had that fish, which I caught rather easily, and I probably had 10 other good fish suck that frog under, but the mat was just so thick. <laughs> when I go to set the hook, I come up with a clump of stuff, you know, like this big. But that was, again, I wasn't planning on throwing a frog. I had one with me, but that was just the the the, the time dictated it because whereas Jeremy's, you know, he's fishing that water that's six feet deep in most places and, and may get deep to 15 a lot of the pits that I fish in can get 30 to 40 feet deep and then run up to like five feet deep around the edges of the pits. Okay. And then some of the, the, the areas that each one of the pits, it seems like has a flat um, that's either connecting two of them or off to the side of it. So, you know, the way I fish both sections is completely different in deep water. I'm out there with a drop shot, a free rig, Jeremy's favorite Texas rig. Um, I'm, I'm fishing offshore probably in 10 feet of water because they'll come up out of that deeper and push up onto those shallower and then they'll stack up around brush or or rock piles and things like that and that's normally where i'm sitting there with you know well i'll go through them um i've got my i got my drop shot tied on um, I, I love these uh um, like a robo worm robo worm it, i think yep. you know that's that and they, i don't know what it is with this color they love this thing like but uh, the sunrise, what kind? What color is that? It's hard to see with your cold. They call it morning dawn. Is is what that is? So it's a very pinkish purple. Okay. And uh, yeah, I got a new rod that I haven't talked about yet that I'm testing from American Legacy. So I was if, wondering if, about if, that. If, if if you know, you know. <laughs> it looks it looks a little clean. Doesn't look uh, no, that cork it looks nice and light. I don't I don't think it's even been out to the water yet, but it will be soon. Um, next quick, one before on, we jump, before we jump to the next one. So how yep. do you fish your, how do you fish your drop shot? When do you, when are you pulling that out every time? Um, when I'm fishing deep, when I'm fishing deeper areas, brush piles, things like that too. Uh, I, I use that one a lot around rocks. If I'm fishing, if I'm fishing, um, around brush piles, that's when I generally switch to a shaky head. But, uh, let's see. My youngest is calling, doesn't realize I'm on a live stream, but he should know. So, um, <laughs> But I, I'll pull shaky heads through brush files if I'm fishing around rocks or um, sometimes um, if there's a, a, a creek where it meets a lake, there'll be like a little pool. I'll, I'll drop it in there as well. 
Um, but it, it's really just kind of a try one or the other and see what the fish kind of like. Sometimes they want it a little bit off of the bottom. Sometimes they want it just, you know, taken along the bottom, you know, dropping a little silt. And, and you know, a lot of people will say that that kind of imitates like a bait fish when it's, you know, feeding off the bottom, mm. kicking up little stuff too. So, it, it, you know, it's one of those things, wobbleheads, you can be imitating a craw, so forth and so on. But, you know, so one for when I just want it up off the bottom a little bit and then the other one for kind of more tangly stuff, if you will. And that's where I'll generally grab a shaky head. So you're kind of using those interchangeably. Yeah. When you're pulling out one, a lot of times you may be pulling out the other shortly after if you're not getting a bite on the first. Yeah, I generally carry a couple of spinning rods with me or I'll throw a shaky head on my um, – a lot of the times a shaky head's on a different bait caster. Yeah. And that's – it's it's a it's, – I won't call it BFS, but it is lighter line, and that's what I'll throw a Senko and other stuff on as well or skip so my like tube. eight pound like fluorocarbon on your shaky head? Okay. Eight, 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 I'll, I'll go from eight to ten. Normally, okay. ten is probably about. I use eight pound. It's it's a liter. It's not something I'm fishing with usually. Got it. I, I know high hopes and aspirations for big fish, but you know, <laughs> Jeremy, what were you gonna say? They make eight pound fluorocarbon. I yeah, mean, I know. <laughs> I I start out at fifteen, and then go to braid. All right. <laughs> I, I don't understand this light line and and uh, I don't know. Just ain't me. <laughs> I, yeah. I pr always use eight pound fluorocarbon for my spinning setups for the Senkos and stuff, but really? I jump quickly to 17 pound for a lot of my other bait caster, the uh, Yamatanuki, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, jigs, that's all 17 up there. So it's either eight or I usually jump up 15, 17 or 20. Okay. Oh, yeah. But just spinning though. I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't break out anything. Any, anytime I go over when I hit 12, it's always, I always go to bait caster, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Pound line. Um, and I get questions like that a lot. That's why I said that. All right, keep going, Grandpa. I'm going to call it Grandpa. Gramps. I like that better. So that was kind of one of the deeper, um, if, if the fish are pushed up on the banks or they're chasing bluegill up on the banks. Mm. Um, you know, my other favorite this time of year is the good old-fashioned black and blue Senko. And, uh, you know, I, I like it on a weightless Texas rig with that ringed EWG hook. Okay. I love that because it helps it fall and gives it a little nose down action, but I can also twitch it and pop it and it actually gives it a kick like a fluke. So I'm actually getting multiple presentations out of one bait because I could just let it drop or I can pop, pop, twitch it. And that the ringed action on this thing just, just fires them up. And then, you know, another, another rod that I haven't revealed yet that the title of the thumbnail on this rod is going to be, is a seven hundred and twenty dollar rod worth it? Ooh. That 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 came from Graham, and it's in upper and lower case. Um, I don't think I've this, ever touched a seven hundred and fifty dollar rod dude, before. This this dude's going to give me a heart attack. He puts this stuff in my hands. <laughs> and says, hey, go back, fish with this. And he's like, "Go fish with this and tell me what you think." I was like, "I think I will never own one." <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you need to get to the point, Graham's, wherever they're like, "Hey, take this." It's yours after you do a video. When is that? T when is that time coming for you? Realistically, I can keep anything he gives me. That's part of my. It's part of my deal. But I like trading. I like trading in Arsenal here and there uh, quite often, just because it allows me to do more reviews, do more. You know, if 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 I want to compare rods that are from Walmart to Lamborghini, then I, I need something as a reference point. And the you know the the uh, G Loomis Conquest line. Mm -hmm is just insane super sensitive but this is not realistically this is a seven foot medium heavy fast action rod the kind of utility for me i don't think the that me testing this one is going to give you the real feel of what a conquest could be mm -hmm. because you want something that's like really sensitive i would want i would expect that i would do that like with a, a jig rod or say a uh, a texas rig rod where you're kind of really dragging stuff on the bottom but i could throw finesse jigs on this as well and uh throw you know throw uh, some you know small tungsten heads jigs on there and get a feel for it too so that's probably what i'll do to kind of to kind of get a real idea but it's kind of over kind of it's a million times overkill <laughs> for senko spinner baits skipping tubes things like that right. if you're going to fish something like this you're a pro who's dragging something very very specific on the bottom a bottom contact you know bottom contact type rod but you know I've tested everything from Walmart up to up to the up to the the Grand Turismo craziness too, so that makes it kind of wild. 
Yeah, it's kind of nice to get your hands on that so you have a good basis for what you're actually, you know. I, one of my, yeah. one of the Instagram, I had Tackle Talk on. Um, we both know Andrew. Yeah, you're the one who put me on, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. And one of my, um, I guess it's called Instagram Reels, is going crazy because he talks about, he, he just makes a statement. It's in the context of a longer conversation. And basically, you, you're not going to to appreciate, you know, going from an ugly stick from Walmart to a $650 Jiggy Loomis. People yeah. lost their minds in the comments. But, oh, I, mean, I think because he talked about ugly stick and it's a common rod that a lot of people use. And yep. people defended their ugly stick like to the death. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. But um, it was interesting. It's, it was interesting. it's like those people who think yum dingers are good. You know, it's just, you know. <laughs> you mean these right here? Yeah, I, I got my bag right yeah, back I know, here. Yeah. Too. I literally, check this out. I went fishing in Central PA um, for smallmouth. I caught 175 fish yeah. on a yum dinger. Red, yeah, you 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 got country. your 20, 20 cent Amazon link purchase from old Gramps because I oh yeah baby. Link <laughs> it's like let me help out the old affiliate marketing over here. He's oh, got yeah. tax. He's got taxes to pay. Let me help I him guess. out. <laughs> got to write the write off, folks. The write off. Yeah, yep. I got the um, they have watermelon red flex for twenty six dollars a bag for of a hundred recently. Yep. It's crazy. All right, moving on. Um, keep going, Gramps. You gave me two. Keep showing me the juice. Um, and of course, if you know, back to skinny water again, because I'll go back and forth. Um, the key is, is this time of year, and it's it, you, literally you have to be it's luck of the draw, being on the right water at the right time when they're actually schooling up and chasing shad. And Jeremy and I've been talking about this all week. It's just a matter of hit and miss, and it's like it's never the same time of the dang day, so you can't really pattern them. It's really just the luck of the draw. So last Thursday when I was in that live stream and we were on a body of water with three other three other anglers and I saw the shad schooling up and being busted right behind one of the other guys fishing. And he was too busy running the stream to notice them behind him. <laughs> and that's when I grabbed ye old jackhammer and proceeded to catch big bass of the event, you know, right, you know, 20 yards behind his kayak. That's amazing. That's one of the best but, feelings. You know, so we were fishing with no electronics, but I was not side scanning. I was side to side scanning, mm -hmm. watching for top water activity. And when I saw a flutter of like 20 shad come up to the surface, I'm like, oh, somebody's on them. And I grabbed the remote, buzzed right over. But yeah, you got within about 40 yards of where I'd seen them and then started whipping this in there and probably three casts in caught that fish. You talk about calling your shot on a live stream, you know, in a live show during uh -huh. the event. You know, the, the old jackhammer was right on the money. And as soon as one of the other guys was like, oh, it's jackhammer time. <laughs> and, you know, everybody who was smart enough to bring a jackhammer is one of their three choices, you know, was uh, we were starting to smack them really good. I'll bring that bad boy up here. You got a white. So for those on the podcast, what are they looking at? What's that trailer? Okay, so this one is the actual, you know, Z-Man jackhammer. Uh, it's in the spot remover color. So it kind of... Uh, uh, it's a very shad. It's it's gray on the top and white on the bottom, so it's patterned correctly. And then the trailer that I like to use, so there's two of them, but that day we can only pick one. Mm -hmm. So I chose the bigger of two. This is the Six Sense Flush, which is basically their version of the Fluke, but it's got, you know, I don't like the paddle tails on the back of a, a chatterbait unless you rig it upside down, but this thing just gives, it just hunts. It gives so much action, and it actually matches the size of the, uh, the bait fish, the spawn, you know, shad this year, and uh, it's it's just right on the money. And had I had the option to fish it in another technique, I literally would have taken it off and fished this weightless because there was so much more grass in this lake that I thought there would be. Mm -hmm. But if I could have taken this off and fished this, you know, fished it weightless, I probably would have just smashed them because I just really wasn't expecting that much grass in the lake that we were in. Okay, but it uh, worked out like a champ and. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things. Good, you know, I see comments like, yep, the Senko sucks, too expensive and tears too easily. <laughs> but when you catch a 500 or a $1,000 bass because of it, you know, I don't I don't invest in what I invest in to fish in tournaments, you know, because if you think about it, I mean, a lot of people recreationally fish, and I get that too. Jeremy and I do that often. But when you're fishing for a check or, you know, big trophies, you know, we, we have a lot tied up into our, it's called the Kayadillac for a reason. Mm. You know, that my whole setup just in the kayak itself is, is, you know, it's a pretty healthy investment. So if I want to fish, you know, Senko's versus like, say, a Berkeley General that I think breaks too easily, 
then yeah, the Senko is going to get it. But I buy them in bulk, so at least I'm trying to save as much as possible. Yeah. But you know, that being said, you can always reuse them, and melt them down, and pour them into a do it mold and do it all again. I mean, we talked on your last show, you know, about the four different the uses four ways, you can get out of one out of one Senko, you know, so it worked out really well. Right. So for those that weren't on, you got your, you know, Texas rig it. Yep. And then when that rips out, wacky rig it. Yep. And then when that breaks, if you still have your worm, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. You got two Ned rigs. Boom. Yep. And then we, when those things are become all gnarly, you melt it down. And if you want to, want some videos how to do it, head over to Fishing with Gramps. And Jeremy, I've seen you guys doing videos where you're doing yep. your old molds from Do It Molds. So oh, yeah. Yeah. that's what I've been. My whole setup right here is strictly for tying jigs, soft plastics, uh, crankbaits, painting them, all kinds of stuff. Nice. I I like my Do It Molds. No, oh, yeah. I need to get into that. It's for me. It's going to be a summer, a summer. I mean, a winter project for me. So maybe in the future you might see some of this. I mean, I have a collection of plastics that are actually destroyed. Can't use them for anything. I need to melt them down and give them a second life. I think that'd be kind of fun to do. Bass Ackwards thirteen says, "I would absolutely appreciate a G Loomis." <laughs> yes, but he also said, "I am on the Walmart level." Laugh out loud. <laughs> yeah, to be completely honest with you. I I have Walmart rods still in my rotation, and I also oh. have three hundred dollar rods in my rotation yep. so i don't know I don't we know. all we all started in a walmart kayak with a you know abu garcia black max it's 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 just where you start now you yeah. know where you want to go i was just joking i was on that fishing trip with a buddy we were in central pa two of us and the, like five years ago i rolled in with like a rhino rod <laughs> like, yeah and i mean we, we smashed on it but that I, I remember the weight i can almost still feel how heavy that thing was yeah <laughs> and so if you do it all the time that stuff starts to matter and as you get older that stuff starts to matter a whole lot what were you going to say jeremy i i was going to mention you know people talk about the cost of rods and especially with g loomis mm. but i have two in my arsenal that are over 25 years old yeah yep. yeah and i i had them repaired uh six months ago just to add them back in because i couldn't live without them yeah. yeah so break down the cost of how much did that cost me each year for 25 years and that makes it yeah. real affordable yeah yep. you take care of them but i mean and, and and some people do that you know you're working overtime or whatever you treat yourself once or twice and then you're living really nice for a lot of years after that too so yeah. it's, it's just one of those things i call it buy once cry once and you know you have to get to a certain point especially if you're raising kids and doing other things yeah that that makes it hard but you know you gotta work you know if you're working that overtime sometimes you gotta you gotta invest in yourself sometimes as well yeah, only cry oh, once. Cool. <laughs> so I get it. All right, so I was doing some little bit of research before the show, and I was like, okay, some of the guys who are known for their lures and, and dialing those in and known for, you know, you can almost like clockwork. These are the lures you throw in August. These are the lures you throw in July. These are the lures. So Tactical Bass is one of those. And Fluke Master does those as well. So give me your thoughts on these are their top five. Tactical Bass is like a top water. They have swim jig. Shaky head and drop shot. I know what your feelings are in the two. And then Fluke yep. Master, uh, a little bit different. So Buzzbait, he breaks out the Whopper Popper. I think he actually refers to the Chapo. Yep. Uh, swim Jig, Jig, Senko, Texas Rig, and the Giant Worm. So any thoughts when I rip through those, you know, top 10, top 12 lures, what are some, what, what first comes to your mind? I, I avoid it. I, I avoid throwing <laughs> what um what they say to do on youtube okay. because that's exactly why i don't fish a wacky rig okay ever because everybody and their brother if you go to a lake they're throwing a wacky rig i'm gonna throw something completely different because the fish get conditioned over you know so many seeing the same thing the stuff that worked 15 years ago works better than what they're saying works now for me yeah so when you hear you hear someone like, "Hey, there's a top five, you were like, "Okay, those are the top five to avoid." <laughs> <laughs> well, there are certain things you can't avoid. For example, I could say a jig should be a top five every month of the year mm. because jigs just flat out catch fish every day of the year. So it's when they start saying, "Well, this is when you do this, and this is when you do that." That translates to me to everybody and their brother who watches YouTube mm. is going to be throwing these particular baits 
And I'll go so far as to say they'll look at the picture uh, or the thumbnail and they'll go out and buy those exact baits that are on the thumbnail mm -hmm. because they want to make sure they're throwing the right top water, the right buzz bait, the right worm, you know? So I avoid throwing whatever's trendy. Oh, interesting take on that. Yep. Interesting. Gramps, what do, what, what do you think? Well, and this is why Jeremy and I have been such great partners over the last many decades of team fishing together, this and that. It's like a lot of people know that, you know, if, if, if they follow, you know, it's always chatterbait, chatterbait, chatterbait. That's all you hear. But Jeremy is the, probably the only one that will tell you if I can only choose one bait to fish year round with, I know his would be a 10 inch power worm. Right. If I could only fish one bait all year round, Jeremy, what would it be? I'll grab it and then I'll show it to him. Well, are, you're not talking chatterbait. That's out, right? Yep. Spinner bait. Well, not a moving bait because oh. if, if I'm throwing a moving bait, you know it's a chatterbait. Good jig. But, but if I'm, yeah, if I'm throwing one bait, you know, year round yeah, and I can only it's, throw it's one and I had to catch a fish, it would be a jig, you know. This one just happens to be a Strike King tungsten with a, a with a missile baits uh, D bomb on it. But the, the you know, uh, realistically, a ch chatterbait is a bladed jig. Mm -hmm. So that still falls in my thing. But it, it jig for me, worm for Jeremy, it's just the way it is. But then, you know, we both do things. He'll throw braid, I'll throw fluorocarbon. Um, you know, we've always done something a little different because his power fishing is different than mine. And we always complement each other too. So, it's just one of those things where if he's not a worm's not doing it, then he's not going to tie on a jig for the most part. He's going to grab <laughs> a baby D bomb or a D bomb and throw it on his Texas rig because that's just what he's used to doing. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So last month and toward the end of the month too. So I still have it tied on um, my top five bass for the knucklehead. Uh, they got a 21.25 and the other two were 19s were caught on a, this guy. The monster bass, I think this is a yep, three eight ounce peanut butter and jelly and Jay, yep. jig right there. And yeah. the trailer I put on that bad boy was a KVD Strike King, uh, the rodent. Let me take this out. Yep, Just that's a green great pumpkin right there. Green pumpkin. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Black fleck. And this thing just boom. I caught two oh four and a half and a five pounder within like 20 minutes of each other. So when these when this was on, it was on. So um, Those little big, monster bass tungsten football I, heads, right there, yeah. man. I'll tell you All what, right. <laughs> that's a sleeper that I don't talk about a lot too, because you know <laughs> that's that's you know giving up some real. But you could drag that thing through rocks or whatever, mm -hmm. and you feel it all too. I found I found these particular bass on a ledge, so I'm always looking for, and specifically in August as well. You know, if if, if I see the water go from you know ten feet to you know five feet, and it takes you know hundred yards to get there, that's not where I'm where i'm fishing I'm, I'm trying to find where that water depth is really tight when it comes to the contour so we're going like 15 to you know eight in a matter of like 20 feet that's or 10 feet sometimes and that's where where i'm finding them so really quick before we i mean we're coming to the end of the live show here which is it's been a lot of fun we kind of went tactical a bit which i really really love <laughs> and uh, i really believe this will help a lot of people kind of dial in their august fishing they're maybe like okay i gotta untie this and potentially tie on something or if you're like jeremy i'm gonna listen to the show and not listen to the word they say and uh <laughs> tie on something different but so what are the bass how are they reacting right now where are you going to find them in let's just say lakes and ponds because i would imagine that's the majority of where kayak bass fishermen are going to be fishing and what are they doing in the morning what are they doing in the heat of the day and what are they doing in the evening who wants to tackle that one well, oh, I'll I guess, tell you, I'll um, tell you, your big fish are going to be caught in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep that's talking. Just, that's just, you know, the heat of the day. You know, if you want to, you got to suck it up and take lots of water. And you can catch more fish evenings and, and mornings because, you know, the, the, the morning bite really is just a play off of the overnight bite. Um, and, you know, Sly Fox is a perfect example of that. He's been smacking them on a spinner bait night fishing quite often, mm. but you know, those cooler sections of the days, but those big dogs are generally, you know, they're not jacking around with trying to compete with the little fish, you know, in the more they're going to go do what they want to do. But a lot of them are doing it in, in the midday or in the middle of the night. And, you know, again, it's just a being there right place, right time. But, you know, people say it's a lot of luck and it really is, you know, you got to be there when they, when they move up to start chasing, 
but uh yeah they're not one to expend a lot of energy you know if they don't have to so if they're there and they're and they're doing it you know you might get into them like i did the other day and uh but uh yeah like like cooler lid is saying make sure you cover up from the sun mm. if you're out there <laughs> if you're out there in the heat of the day yeah yep. sly, sly fox hey i've been killing them at night including that 21.25 inch yeah that was a nice that's fish, a, big, that's a big girl big girl yeah both of you caught you both of you caught my pbs and passed me by a quarter inch so that's that's good on you and sly fox with those 21 and a quarter inch donkeys uh, that's for ohio that's a that's a that's, that's a, a big, big fish. and he's in ohio yeah. too so yeah right on right on i love it so here's kind of my thoughts and then jeremy i'll pass it off to you what happens in august at least it's my experience right so in the morning right when there's that low light I mean, bass are roaming, right? They could they could really be be anywhere. Um, you find them in shallows. Usually, that's where I fish them in the morning. I, I just run a bank, and usually I can get some nice ones. Um, but I got good news for you. Whenever the sun comes up in August, um, a lot of those fish, in my opinion, they move to the shadows, right? right they're trying yeah. to find, and the big ones, like they're in the shadows next to deep water. Yep. And so if you're trying to dial in, okay, I need to catch. I'm in the knucklehead. I need to put up, I need to start putting up some big fish. I can catch little ones all day long, but I need to catch some big ones. Find the shadows, especially for fishing in the middle of the day, next to that, that deep, where, where I caught them on the jig, 1919 19 and 21. Wherever that water is, goes deep to shallow and find, look around, try to find the, the, the cover. Um, I believe, especially toward the end of August, they're moving a lot from the grassy cover to kind of like hard cover, wood, some of that. Um, Lay down stuff like that is where I have a tendency to to find them. At least I've been finding them recently. And so, if you can dial that in for your body of water, and I know not a lot of us are thinking right now. I'm sure, literally imagining the place in your brain <laughs> where those <laughs> fish are like hanging out at this very moment. And like, and so that's where you're going to want to be. That's where you're going to be tossing in in August. That's just my experience. Hopefully, that's helpful for you, Jeremy. Your thoughts on where they're at right now. I agree 100%. Shadows are where the biggest fish are going to be. And the deepest, darkest part of the shadow mm. is where you should try first. Um, but there again, I think also the deep water is key because I have this spot that's a roadbed. And there used to be a bridge where the creek mm. ran underneath it. Well, they took the bridge out. Then they flooded it. So you've got a roadbed with really good grass definition. But there, where the bridge used to be, it drops off into 10-foot channel, then comes right back up. It's very sharp drops. Oh, wow. I was out there a week and a half ago, I and I told JT, I'm only fishing from noon to 3. Yeah. The hottest part of the day, where nobody wants to go fishing, I got to the lake at 1130, on the water by noon, off the water by 3. I, I caught three 19s and 18 and two 17 and three quarters. Come on now. In two hours. Dang. And they were in four foot of water with 10 foot of water, two feet, literally two feet away. It dropped to 10 foot. Yep. They were coming up, eating it and running right back right into right that down. deep water. <laughs> and it was a cycle. They would yep. just continue to move up and eat and then back down. So, it, when you find the fish are schooled up, which they're normally schooled up by now, Indiana's been weird. They didn't really school up. They should have last month. They're just now schooled up where I'm starting to find schools instead of picking one off here, one off there. Because mm. you get into now, school, at the beginning of the show, too. I was going to say at the beginning of the show, too, you talked about where we're starting at in August and where we're going to end in August. Right. And the key thing, especially for those in boats and kayaks that are off of the bank. It's it's that that later summer pattern when that thermal climb starts coming up and those fish are suspended off of the bottom. That's when you're going to be sitting them, you know, watching them sitting eight feet down, and you're going to want to grab those crank baits and those jerk baits and twitch, 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 and tear them up. So again, if you got your electronics and you're out on the water, those are the things you're going to want to watch for because you know, like again, the shallow fish will still be shallow. But those dudes who like to live and stay deep in that cooler water, that oxygen depletion is gonna is gonna change and it's gonna push them up because they will not sit below the thermocline. They bass, you know, catfish, carp, the rest of them, they don't care. Bass, they want to stay above it. So until the lake turns over, when we get more towards the fall, and that's probably August going into September, 
but this year has been weird. So we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on that too. So that's another thing you'll start noticing on your electronics, especially your down imaging. Mm. When you start seeing that fuzz in the water, that's three, four or five feet off of the bottom. You'll see that's the thermocline starting to come up too. So that's something that you want to watch for as we get towards the end of the month, going into September as well. And those fish will, you know, they still like staying in that cooler submerged, you know, being down there, but that's when you want to start grabbing those deeper, deeper running, you know, jerk baits and, you know, fishing that eight to 10 foot, you know, mark as well. And I've got, I've got one particular pond. I'm kind of waiting for that to happen because I know there's some big bass in there mm. and I saw it last year and I haven't been back there yet this year, but I was kind of waiting for the conditions to get similar. So I can go back and try something last year that it could potentially land me a PB because that's something I'm still chasing this year is a catch PB. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be out there putting those electronics to work too. Two things, since you mentioned your catch PB, what is it now and what do you need to use to beat it? And two, you use the word that, I mean, people use every once in a while, but may be misunderstood. So explain what thermocline is and how it affects bass fishing. And how do okay, you use so, it to your advantage? Yeah. Um, first off, my catch PB is 21 inches. So, wow. you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm actually trying to beat this year. Now the thermocline, um, it happens every year. It's just part of nature. Um, uh, there's oxygen levels in the water. And I guess the, the easiest way to, to put it is, is, is that the, at the lakes will, will be called, they'll turn over. And so the thermocline is a level of oxygen that sits kind of at the bottom, but as it depletes, it'll start rising to the top. And um, it, this, there's a new cycle of it, probably I think twice a year, uh, maybe one like kind of over winter and then another, you know, the summer is where it's most prevalent. But as the oxygen levels at the bottom start to deplete, it'll, it'll kind of rise up. And then it kind of, it pushes the fish up with it because they want to be in some place where the water is really oxygenated. It's not as prevalent in like your skinny lakes with a lot of grass in it because the grass actually introduces a lot of, um, a lot of it. You'll see this more in lakes with deep holes or mm -hmm. like a lot of the strip pits that I fish in. And, uh, but, but the thermocline, and I actually did a, a full length video on this. Um, and so I'm trying to repeat something that, you know, it's something I kind of wrote a script for last year. Right. But the, the oxygen level will come up and eventually it'll come up in the surface and then the lake will then turn over. That pretty much kills fishing for, I don't know, Jeremy, what, seven to ten days, it seems like, until the mm -hmm. fish settle back down. And it's weird because then, like, oxygen will fall back to the bottom of the water. Um, it's kind of a weird process, but there's better people than I that can that, that can describe it. But I did a good video on discussing what it all is. But it's it's just one of those things that you can use it to your advantage because it pushes those big fish that are out deep more up to the surface until the lake actually finishes turning over generally around right before that big fall bite really kicks off. Because that's also one of the triggering mechanisms for the bass, along with the lack of sunlight and, you know, the, the conditions changing that they know, hey, winter is coming. It's mm -hmm. time to start slamming everything that I can. And that's when you grab that chatterbait mini max Ooh, and here we go. throw it down and just tear them up. Here we go. It's going to be some really great fishing over the next three months. Really oh, yeah, great yeah. fishing. And, yeah. uh, almost as pumped up as I am when, you know, May rolled around. Uh, yes. and, whew, so good. All right. I'm going to finish off with this question. We're over, we're, we're over an hour and we usually land a plane here, but I, I, I had a comment come in and I want both of you to answer it for me. It comes from Bass Ackwards 13. He says, and this might be a lot of guys and gals out there. I follow all the quote unquote rules and guidance and I just can't get on them. What do you, what would you say to Bass Ackwards? Start, start throwing a, a seven inch worm <laughs> with a glass rattle and become proficient at it because that's the quickest and easiest way to, to find them, to catch them and and you know and i say a worm it's it, there's a lot of things with other baits that you have to think about and retrieve and cadence and rhythm and all the different things that you have to build over years that you're doing to trigger bites when i can put a worm or a rod and reel with a worm on it in a guy's hand and they're catching fish by the end of the day mm learn one technique whatever your technique is learn it really well and you will catch more fish and you'll feel like you're you'll have that aha moment and that leads to the next aha moment and the next thing you know you're on them all year long yeah and there's you, so you many there's, start. 
Yeah, and even though I love a jig, Jeremy's right. It's seven inch Texas rig worm. You can drag it, you can pop it, you can swim it. You know, you can find something, but there will be some bass somewhere that is going to, you know, it doesn't matter if it's six inches or, you know, a 20 inch or yeah. it's going to, it's going to smack them. So the other, the other most common one that I you know, I feel is very similar to that, that if I was going to say, you know, if you're, if you're just want to cast a reel, grab spinnerbait yep. and throw it in every direction and just keep casting and reeling between one of those two baits, you're going to catch a fish. And it's not, it's not, it, it's, you know, don't think that because we all go fishing all the time and we make YouTube videos, you see the hours of, of, you know, footage over a year of all the fish that we catch. Uh -huh. You're not seeing the months of footage <laughs> where we're out there doing anything but catching fish. Um, but pay attention to your surroundings. I know a lot of people that listen to music and headphones and, and, you know, other, you know, I, I I've done it too, some ball games and all that too, but pay attention to your surroundings. Watch the birds, especially if you're in a kayak or a boat. Um, if there's birds there, they're feeding on bait fish. Those bass are feeding on those same bait fish. You know, if you hear something smacking on the water, check it out. You know, bank anglers, you're limited to a lot. But, you you know, the, the key for being a bank angler, too, though, is be patient. Make as long a cast as you can and take as long as you can dragging that worm or a Texas rig crawl or something back to you too, but learn to feel what's on the bottom, learn to know when you're coming over a log or a rock or, you know, different structure underneath the water. And, you know, you kind of, kind of just get in tune with nature too, but it takes patience, but that's, that's part of the game. You know, we don't go out and catch a 20 every month. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, that's, I, I've had a month of dinks and then I'll catch a 19, you know, mm -hmm. am I going to catch, you know, five 19s in a row or no, I don't have that much time to fish, but you know, if you have the ability to be on the water, that's just increasing your chance every time, you know, you catch those little ones and then, you know, any bite that you get could be your smallest fish or your biggest fish ever. And that's really what keeps us going back. Yeah. So when I hear this, I follow all the rules and guidance and just can't get on them. A couple of things come to mind for me. It's so it, it's really easy to hop on YouTube and get discouraged really fast. I'm reiterating yeah. kind of what Gramps just said, because you might come to a channel or someone you enjoy and it could be one of our channels and you, you see fish like posted every day in the community tab i don't catch those <laughs> every day yeah i would i would disillusion the whole thing right i have probably 40 photos in queue ready to to post yes i do catch a, a lot of fish but it's because and I think this is key and scott for for mantra said something he said some have been too much adulting not enough fishing and this is it and if you're you're someone who's just going out um, and it's great and you're a weekend warrior and you you might get out a couple weekends on Saturday morning and maybe some ad hoc here and there and you're fishing maybe five, six times a month, then it's going to be really discouraging watching someone or following someone like, well, to be honest, like me, I'm out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in, in the morning before work at five o'clock a.m. a lot of the times. Um, and putting putting in the work, putting in the time, time in the water is going to greatly increase. But I'll, I'll be completely honest. I was out this morning. I had three on the line, lost three. I got I got skunked for the first time in since I can remember. It was it's been probably since the beginning this season. I don't think I've been yeah. skunked until till today. And that's just you know a couple of weeks ago, I was catching nineteens and twenties. And so sometimes they're just not they're just not biting, right? Or you're right. not in the area where where they're at. And so it it happens to the best of us. What what did you learn the day you went out and got skunked? You mean this morning? Yeah. What, I really what, haven't. What, what, um, what, did, what, what did you learn from it, though? Yeah, this is a great question. I always, I teach in my videos, the, the goal isn't to go from one to 100. The goal is to be 1% better than when you went out last time. So I love that you're asking this question. So it the, it rained all day yesterday. I mean, mm -hmm. all day. I mean, you guys are in Indiana. You probably right. got that before I did. <laughs> yeah. and it would not yeah. stop raining the entire day. And I keep track of the water temperature. And there's a five-degree drop. In water temperature i was like all right interesting it's like a cold front i was wearing my jacket all morning it's typically known to put the bite off and um man what did what did i learn it really it was more revolving around weather conditions and what that may or may not do i feel like they a lot of the places i have been catching them last month they're not there anymore so they moved probably to some offshore structure fishing a lot of banks and getting real good luck on them 
Um, but they move somewhere. And so I've been thinking about, okay, where could they possibly be if they, they're usually here? They're probably close by, just just where? And so and this is back to the conversation now that I have side scan with my um, echo map. I'll say, okay, they're not to the left of me where I usually cast. They're probably just right there on that hard cover that I can see on my side scan. But I've never fished it. I never break. I never broken out the shaky head or dragged a Texas rig over it to find out. And so, what I learned is I need to grab some of my DIY um, marker buoys, throw those in the side of my kayak, and try a little different way of fishing. Um, because what I what has been successful in the last few weeks wasn't successful this morning. So I got to try. I gotta try to up my game a little bit by trying something a little bit different. So that's what I learned this morning. Great question. And that that makes it worth going because if you learn something, whether you catch them or not, I had a day the other day, I got skunked. Yeah. And I was like, man, nothing's working, nothing's working. So I put down the rod and I went scanning and was doing grid scans because my goal is to learn something new about a lake I'm on. And I pulled up to this one section. I'd fished like seven hours at this point, hadn't mm -hmm. even had a bite. And pull up, see something on my side image. I flip to it, bam, 16 inch fish. I'm like, yeah. really? Hmm. I wouldn't have done that in the past. I would have tried to force what I wanted to do and, and try to make them bite. Yeah. But you, you don't ever force, you know, I, I want to know what do they want to eat. And then I'll give that to them instead of I'm going to catch them on this chatterbait. Cause that's my thing. I, I can't catch fish on chatterbait. <laughs> yeah. My brother, yeah, him, he, me, me frogs, him chatterbait. Yep. So, well, 100%. I love, I love that. Right. So uh, it, it would have been really easy for me to be like, I'm out of here and just leave. I did try out a few more things. I went out to the middle and started scanning around, um, utilizing my time. So they're not going to bite. Might as well learn something. Right. Exactly. So keep that in mind. And now yeah, I am. I will tell you, he was on the phone with me when I caught that 20 last month. Yeah, I was frustrated, nothing bit all day long, and it was the middle of the afternoon, and I was like, I'm just going to go scanning, and then I did. I spent the next half an hour, I found a rock pile, pulled up on it, backed off, and started casting to it, threw a free rig around a, around these rocks, and then doink, and there it was, and I'm literally on the phone with him saying, you know, yep, this is what happened, so it was just one of those funny things. Yeah. Well, we're at one hour, 19 minutes, guys. This has been a sick show. Thank you so much for hopping on, sharing a little bit of the juice with everybody. Hopefully this brings some, help, elevates the game a little bit, right? If you can come to the show, learn maybe something new you can try out and you land a fish, man, that's a, that's a huge, huge freaking win. So okay. thanks for stopping by.